Getting a visa to work or study in the US can be a really confusing process. I recently sat down with entrepreneur and author Saundaria Balasubramani, who's gotten no less than six visas to work and study in the US. She shared some valuable information I wanna share with you now about getting a talent visa to the US. Saundaria can make clear for you the best visa to get and how to get it. I'm Rachel and I've been teaching English and the American accent on YouTube for over 15 years. Check out my free course, The Top Three Ways to Master the American Accent by visiting rachelsenglish.com slash free. I'm so glad to be introducing you all to Soundaria. She's an author and a founder of Unshackled.club, a community providing support and resources to individuals navigating the talent visa process. First, What's the difference between an H-1B and an O-1A talent visa? She recently explained in a webinar that she did for my students. And that's why you should care about talent visas because the O-1A, which you see seeing on the screen here, it doesn't have a lottery. It doesn't require you to go through a process where you have to pray that your name gets selected. So that's the very first difference between the H-1B and the O-1A. They are both work visas, they are both temporary visas, but these are the differences. A few more differences are, on an H-1B, you have to make a minimum salary. Uh, what this means is, someone asked me, is the H-1B for skilled workers? It is for skilled workers. Um, a lot of people in tech apply for the H-1B, for example, and the employer has to pay a certain minimum salary when you're on an H-1B. On the O1A, you don't need to make a minimum wage. And this is great for founders because founders don't want to take salary out of their company. Third difference is that the H1B, you can only file during March of each year. But the O1A can be filed anytime from anywhere. You can also file the H1B from anywhere, um, to be clear. But the O1 can be filed at any point during the year. There's no restriction. Finally, fourth, H1B, you have to have a direct relationship between your job and the degree. What this means is, if you had a degree in, say, computer science, your job cannot be a life coach or your job cannot be an artist. There has to be a, a direct relationship. On the O1A, you don't need to have a direct relationship. You can switch fields. But the O1 does require you to have other things, which we'll talk about. H1B can only be extended to six years. O1 has no limitation. So if you get it once, you can renew it unlimited number of times. Last point is that the H-1B, you have to wait till October. So even if you get shows in the lottery, you have to wait till October for it to be effective. But the O-1A is immediate. If you get an approval from today, you're effectively on the O-1 if you apply through that process. Now, um, someone asked, um, Lala asked, do you need to be employed for filing O-1A? Yes, they're both work visas. So you need a sponsor. You can have an agent be a sponsor for you on the O-1. An agent can be an individual, not a company necessarily, but they both require you to have a sponsor. Sandaria, I know that yes. in your community, a lot of people have gotten ONA. How easy is it if you're not currently employed to find a sponsor like what you mentioned? Is that a pretty rare road to take? This is where I think I need to talk more about the O1 first, because while okay. the O1 has all these amazing qualities that you're seeing on the screen, it's meant for people who are at the top of their fields. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to get. I mean, the US introduced the O1 back in 1990 because they wanted talented yeah. people from across the world to come to America. Mm -hmm. And so that's the main difference is that okay. while the O1 has advantages, um, it's meant for people who are at the top of their fields mm -hmm. and they measure that through very interesting criteria, which we'll come to. Okay. But to answer okay. the question, how easy is it to get a sponsor? As I said, you can have an agent apply for you. An mm -hmm. agent, I've seen an agent just be a mentor for some mm -hmm. people, but the person still has to show that, yeah, I have three years worth of work that I yeah. can do in a minute. Let's jump ahead to that criteria. How do you know if you can apply for an O1A visa? We talked a lot about why the O1 and EB1 are awesome visas, but the catch is they're meant for people, once again, who are experts in their field. And the way US decides you're an expert is through something called the eight pillars. This is also a page from Untrackled, but I thought it would be a very good summary of what the eight pillars are. When you don't have obvious international acclaim, such as a Nobel Prize, 
or Olympic medal, which you know most of us or none of us really have. USCIS measures your extraordinary ability by checking if you meet three out of eight criteria. They still need some way to see why do you think you're awesome in your field, and that's where they came up with these eight criteria just to set the expectation. They wrote these this criteria in 1990, 34 years ago. They wow. wrote down this criteria. That's why some of the things would make no sense today. But just understand that they have evolved with the times a little bit, not by a lot. But the reason some of the criteria may seem just not relevant to you is because it was written many, many, many years ago. So there's eight criteria. Just because the height of this pillar is top, higher than this doesn't mean this criteria is more important. Don't think of it that way. We just did that for it to look nice. If you meet any three criteria of the eight, you have a shot at getting the O1A or the EB1A. O1 and EB1 have the same criteria essentially. Unshackled is Soundaria's book that she wrote to explain everything about getting a talent visa to the US and you can get your own copy by following the link in the video description. What's your current job role? Can you guys just write down what is your job role? What's your area of specialty? Like are you a software engineer, product manager, artist? Just, just write down what you currently do. Okay, a lot of software engineers, which is good to know actually. Actor, very interesting. Journalist, professor, engineer, 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 engineer. Here's the good news. I think a lot of the O1 criteria applies to people in tech, engineering. It doesn't mean it doesn't apply to the rest of you who said actors and architects and teachers. It definitely applies to you as well. Let's assume that you, I'm just gonna take a software engineer for example. Let's also assume that you work at a company where you play kind of an important role. If you do that, then you probably satisfy the number eight over here that says critical capacity. So critical capacity essentially means you play an important role in a company that is reasonably distinguished. So let's take, for example, um, Airbnb. You're a software engineer at Airbnb and you worked on a feature or a product that helped increase the revenue for the company by several million dollars. I'm just giving an example. If you can get a letter from your manager saying this in word, then it might help you in satisfying number eight, critical capacity. Now, let's also assume that you get paid a pretty good salary at your company. Number six, high salary essentially means you are paid in the top 20, 25% of people in your job role and in your location. If you're in Colombia, and in Colombia, you're in a very specific city. Go and check what is the average salary that a software engineer gets paid in that city. And if you can show that you're in the top 20%, 10%, then you can say that, hey, I'm getting paid a high salary. Another common example I see for software engineers is number three, judging. So number three, judging. Judging essentially means as an engineer, you have judged the work of other people, other engineers in your field. So let's say that you went to a hackathon and you were one of the five judges. If you can get a letter or even an email that says you were invited as a judge, you can show that as evidence. And I'll talk about just maybe one more. Number five, authorship. Authorship is about you showing that I have published articles or papers or books in my field and it went through an editorial process. For a software engineer, this could mean publishing an article in a famous cybersecurity blog if you're a cybersecurity engineer. You, if you can just show that my article went through some process before it got published, then you could show that as evidence of authorship. So like this, there's eight criteria and you have to show evidence for at least three of the eight criteria. Ideally, people show evidence for at least five just because you wanna you know, build a very strong profile in front of the officer, but you have to at least show three. That's the bare minimum. I can go through the other criteria, but honestly, what I would love for you all to do is to go and read about this in more depth after the call. Like go Google 018 criteria and read about what each of the criteria means. There, you heard me mention a student scholarship. This is for students who want to join unshackled.club to work towards getting their own talent visa. If you go to rachelsenglish.com slash visa, and scroll down a bit, you'll find a section on how to apply for the student scholarship. 
At rachelsenglish.com slash visa, you can also learn more about unshackled.club, the community that Soundaria founded, which includes lawyers and people who've already been successful in getting their talent visas. Thank you so much for watching and learning with me. Don't forget to visit rachelsenglish.com slash free for my free course on the American accent that will give you some real training to sound more natural speaking American English. Keep your learning going now with this video and don't forget to subscribe with the notifications on. I love being your English teacher. That's it and thanks so much for using Rachel's English.